Hey guys, welcome to the 14th episode of Short Bits by Shorty. Um, just a few reminders and a few event invites. Number one, feel free to subscribe always at the red subscribe button at the bottom. You get notifications whenever I post a new video. Um, number two, so big event this weekend for PDC. We got Phi Dex Fest, our annual fundraiser for our annual fall fundraiser for St. Jude's Research Hospital, which provides free treatment and board and lodging for parents and their families for children undergoing uh, serious diseases and treatment at St. Jude's Research Hospital. So Phi Dex Fest is this Saturday, October ter 13th. From six, uh, starting at six p.m. at on the rocks. Uh, Fifteen dollars per person gets you all the fun with PDC. Um, we got let's see a whole array of buffet items. So all you can eat, you get veggie tray, cheese tray, meatballs, chicken salad wrap, Caesar wrap, brownie tray, chips and salsa, pretzel bites, chicken tenders. And a whole bunch of other items. So meat friendly, vegetarian friendly, and it's three dollar rails and three dollar domestic beers. Please do not trick and drive. It's legal again in the state of Virginia. Um, let's see. You also get food, karaoke, speed bingo, and raffles. I made one of the raffle baskets. You can probably tell which one I made. It's high fun, high functionality. That's the theme of my basket. Um, we'll be tabling all week. Come out and have a good Saturday night with PDC. Um, for St. Jude's Research Hospital. Number two, we got Skate for the Cure, KE's annual event. Um, Skate for the... Ooh, that's Ratchet. Okay. Skate for the Cure. KE's event, it's on... Let's see. Saturday, October 27th. From 5.45 p.m. until 8 p.m. at Skate Nation Plus. Blah, blah, blah. So they'll have raffles, prizes, games, and lots of fun ice skating with your fellow classmates, KE, KY, and PDC kids. Um, this year's theme is Disney on Ice, so don't forget to wear your best costume. Best costume wins a prize. They can't wait to see you there. So yeah, two big events for KE and PDC this month, Fidex Fest and Skate for the Cure. See you there. I might sing karaoke at Fidex Fest. Alright, let's get started. Okay, to start off, I'm gonna go over I'm gonna go over Dr. Go's introduction of anti-epileptic drugs. So, um, the ideal anti-epileptic would completely suppress seizures. It would produce no sedation and other CNS side effects, and it worked against her for a variety, wide variety of seizures. And in terms of the side effects, it also has no effect on vital functions such as respiration, um, and etc. And most importantly, it has a rapid onset and long duration. So one of the first drugs discovered for anti-epilepsy was potassium bromide. Mechanism of action, no one really knows. Um, but it's effective, but it produces sedation, which is its limiting factor in its use. The main targets for anti-epileptic drugs are GABA receptors, including chloride channels, which all which GABA receptors which act on chloride channels, and sodium channels, which are excitatory channels. So your chloride channels are inhibitory, and your sodium channels are excitatory. I thought Dr. Simselli did a good job with this lecture on explaining epilepsy and the pharmacology of epilepsy. So please refer her to refer to her lecture for more explanation on this in case you do need an explanation. I'm going to focus on the chemistry also because I don't really have time to explain the pharmacology of it. Okay, so now we're going to talk about your phenobarbital or your barbiturates. Barbiturates? And their derivatives. So your prototype for the barbiturates is phenobarbital, shown here. It's metabolized to uh, P or parahydroxyphenobarbital, where the hydro parahydroxy, or remember, para there's ortho meta para para is the one. So here's med ortho 
meta para is the one across the other bond. So para, para hydroxy phenobarbital. So it's basically phenobarbital. Here's phenobarbital. You add a hydroxy at the para position. Remember, ortho, meta, para. Para is the one across the other bond, and that's para hydroxy. So this is the active form, and it's actually the one inducing the CYP 2B6 enzyme. So here are your other barbiturates. You have phenobarbital, methobarbital, and methabarbital. Methobarbital in the middle is metabolized to phenobarbital, and methabarbital is more sedative than phenobarbital. So, um, going off Glow's question in class, which he confused most of us during class, but there finally was an answer. Um, so which, comparing phenobarbital and methobarbital, the one in the middle, which one would you expect to be more water-soluble? Phenobarbital or methobarbital? You would expect phenobarbital to be more water soluble. More water soluble. Why is that? Um, so this one is more water soluble. Because, remember, um, if you remember from my videos explaining Glennon's lecture, Methyl groups make things more lipophilic. So methobarbital has a methyl group right here, so that makes it less water soluble compared to phenobarbital, which has no methyl group right here. But everything else is the same if you compare the structures. The only thing different is the methyl group here, which phenobarbital doesn't have. So since phenobarbital doesn't have that methyl group, it's less lipophilic, therefore more water soluble. So comparing methobarbital and methobarbital, these two, which one do you expect to be more water soluble? Metho or metha? You would expect methabarbital to be more water soluble. Why? Just like earlier, adding more methyl groups makes a compound more lipophilic. So everything else is the same. The only thing different is this phenyl group here and this ethyl group here. So since this, is, since this phenyl group has more carbons compared to this ethyl group, methobarbital is more lipophilic, therefore less water soluble than methobarbital. Um, yep, cool. So now here's the chemistry about barbiturates, which we'll, we'll apply later on during this video. So, your classic barbiturate is this delta lactam ring, alpha, beta, gamma, delta. Yeah, so delta lactam. So, lactam is basically, basically a six, um, yeah, uh, never mind. Um, so, delta, this is a delta lactam, structure of a delta lactam. Keyword, delta lactam. Keyword. So, barbituric acid or phenobarbital contains a delta lactam. Um, you can, ch uh, this structure can change around so that, um, this oxygen, double bond oxygen becomes one hydroxyl group. Everything else staying the same. So this N, N, H, double bond O, double bond O, the only thing that changes is, uh, this double bond O becomes a hydroxyl group. And this is term, when, when one of the hydroxyl one of the double bond oxygens becomes a hydroxyl group, it's termed a lactam. Um, so lactam contains no hydroxyls, a lactam contains at least one hydroxyl. Um, this change from a double bond O to a hydroxyl is termed a tautomerization. Um, it's called, a tautomerization is basically a change or, yeah, a change in the molecule in terms of the placement of the hydrogen. So, as you can see, um, which I should have drawn correctly earlier. Okay, so the hydrogen is supposed to be next to the nitrogen. Okay, yeah. So, this hydrogen shifted over 
to here to make the hydroxyl. So in order for this double bond O to become a hydroxyl, this hydrogen shifts over to the, hydro the double bond O to become a hydroxyl. That process is called top trimerization. Keyword, top trimerization. So this lactim over here can become another lactim by another process of top trimerization where this hydro hydrogen shifts over to here, this double bond oxygen to form another hydroxyl. So now you have two hydroxyl groups and it's still a lactim. So remember, a lactim is basically a lactam with hydroxyl. So a lactam contains no hydroxyls, a lactim contains at least one hydroxyl. Now when all three uh, double bond oxygens become hydroxyls, it's turned an enolic acid. And it's called an acid because the um, hydroxyl group can form a negative to charge oxygen and a positively charged hydrogen. Remember, opposites attract. Um, so when you uh, opposites attract, so a positive hydrogen is attracted to a negative oxygen, and putting these two together is basically a hydroxyl group. So an acid contains a uh, positively charged hydrogen. Um, this is technically the same thing because it's still a hydroxyl OH OH except it ionizes or forms an ion to form the actual acid, which is a positively charged hydrogen and negatively charged oxygen. Any of these groups can do this. So this can form a positively charged hydrogen with a negatively charged oxygen. This can form a positively charged hydrogen with a negatively charged oxygen, um, as shown here. So this, this hydroxyl can become a negatively charged oxygen and a positively charged hydrogen. So any of these hydroxyl groups can do it. I'm just too lazy to draw it out. Um, so technically, you can have a total of, of three acid groups. Remember, your acid groups are your parts of the molecule that can form a positively charged hydrogen and then negatively charged uh, oxygen. So you have a total of three acid groups, which will be important later. So in summary of barbiturate chemistry, barbiturates are delta lactams that can form lactams which are lactams that have hydroxyl groups. And lactin, these lactams can become an enolic acid, which contains all three hydroxyl groups. And all three hydroxyl groups can, be form, can form acid groups, which are negatively charged oxygens and positively charged hydrogens. Um, a technical description of lactams are cyclic carboxymic acids with endocyclic C carbon nitrogen double bonds. In English, what this means is, here is, so a cyclic carboxymidic acid is your, um, lactam, okay. Um, let's see, what's a good one, okay. So your imid contains your nitrogens. Your carboxyl, your carboxyl is technically this carboxyl group, which changed over to the acid. So here's your carboxymidic acid. It contains a nitrogen and the carboxyl group, which changed to the acid group. And endocyclic carbon nitrogen double bond means a carbon nitrogen double bond inside the ring. And what that's referring to is this double bond right here. So that's endocyclic, meaning it's inside the ring, and it's a carbon-nitrogen double bond, because there's your nitrogen, there's your carbon. Um, so that's the technical definition of a carboxymidic acid. Um, let's see. Now, if you change, you can get your uh, phenobarbital derivatives by just changing a few groups. For example, you can get from phenny, hmm, did I explain that? Phenobarbital, phenobarbital, you can get primidone through isostamer, isosterism. Remember, isos, isosters are basically compounds that have the same activity but just differ in a uh, part of the structure. So primidone also acts on GABA receptors, as you know from Sincelli's lecture. Um, Except the only thing that changes is this double bond became just a, 
uh, carbon with a hydrogen. So the isoster part is the change from a double bond oxygen to um, just a single carbon. Uh, fun fact: you might not know how this. You probably don't have to. Don't know have to have to know the structure. But phenytoin um, can be the our carbon mazepine is actually a derivative of phen of um, far phenobarbital because if you look at it right here, here is. Um, this group is the same as this group, therefore acting on the same, pretty much the same receptor, uh, having pretty much the same activity as an anticovulsin. Pretty cool, right? Fun fact. Um, okay, so let's see. Your hydantoins are basically your phenytoin derivatives, except instead of being six-membered rings, they're five-membered rings. So compare the structure if you want. Uh, phenobarbital and the hydantoins yourself, and you'll see that the only difference is that hydantoins are five membered rings. They have this same carboxymidic acid over here. Um, this can tautomerize, I oh, like that keyword, tautomerize because this hydrogen shifts over to this oxygen to form the hydroxyl group to form this, and this forms the acid which is the negatively charged oxygen and the positively charged hydrogen. This also targets GABA receptors, since they have the same carboxymidic group, basically. However, they have weaker acidity than barbiturates. So they're weaker acids than barbiturates. Why? So remember I said earlier that barbiturates have a total of three acid groups. So, And how many acid groups do, this, do the hyaline and toins have? Two. So here's your, which can, this can be changed into an acid group, and here's your acid group. So this has a total of two acid groups. So it's a weaker acid than barbit the barbiturates, phenobarbital, because phenobarbital has three acid groups. This has a total of two acid groups, therefore it's a weaker acid since it has less acid groups. Um... Fun fact, another fun fact, you probably don't, don't know how to know the structure, but um, phenytoin is named because it's a hydantoin. So your hydantoins have the suffix toin. Toin is your hydantoin, so phenytoin, um, mephenytoin, ethotoin are your hydantoins. So phenytoin is named so because it has phenyl groups on the hydantoin group. Ah, fun fact. Phenytoin is a phenylated hydantoin. This has low sol H2O solubility. Why? Because remember, adding more methyl groups makes a compound more lipophilic and less water soluble. So since it has two phenyl groups, phenyls are, pr are have more, there are more, f uh, phenyls are, Highly lipophilic because they have more carbons, so therefore they're less water soluble. Um, Methphenytoin, um, the metabolite is nirvanol, which is shown here, and the S isomer, the S, the S enantiomer, is 14 times more, undergoes 14 times more hydroxylation at the 4 position of the phenyl group versus R. So here's the phenyl group, here's 1, 2, 3, 4, the 4 group. Um, this position right here undergoes more hydroxylation, 14, 14 times more hydroxylation than the R enantiomer. Probably don't know how the structure, but maybe you might have to know that concept. Ethotoin is metabolized to the active form. Um, next up, you got in the hydantoins, you have phosphenytoin. Um, phosphenytoin is named so because it's a phenytoin except it has a phosphate group attached to it. This um, is a prodrug, which is metabolized to phenytoin, um, and it's more water soluble because of this phenyl phosphate group. Remember, phosphate groups can form negative charge. This is at here, the acid group, the acid group here. So more charges means... Um, So it's highly water-soluble because it can form a charge compound. Remember, 
charged compounds or ionic, com ionic compounds ionic compounds are highly water soluble because <sighs> chem 101 in case you forgot um, so here's the negative part um, charged compounds can attract to the opposite poles of water um, let's see And if you want to see where phosphate, the phosphate binds, you have P O. Yeah, P O. There you go. P O. Remember the oxygen forms negative charges. And there you go. And if you want. There's your hydrogen forming a positive charge. So that's where it attracts on water. So that's why it's more water soluble, because charged compounds are water soluble. That's why phenytoin is highly water soluble. Your oxazolidine dions are basically isosteres of their hydantoins. Um, so instead of this nitrogen right here, you have this oxygen right here. And you can tell it's a oxidolidine dione because it has trimethadione, paramethadione. Um, succinamides, you can tell it's succinamide because it has the word succinamide in it. So succinamides have the word succinamide in it. These, um, these are also isosteres because this nitrogen is just a simple carbon. And they have less activity than your phenobarbitals. Next, we're going to talk about your GABA analogs. So remember the structure of GABA, which looks like this? Your GABA analogs basically act like GABA because they look like GABA. Um, so gabapentin looks like GABA. Um, Vegabatrin looks like GABA. Vegabatrin inhibits GABA de degradation. Um, this part is pretty much self-explanatory. It just gives you a bunch of mechanisms. I'll just read them to you in case you're bored. Um, pregabalin binds to voltage-gated calcium channels. Tiagabine is a GABA uptake inhibitor, so up inhibiting the reuptake of GABA allows it to act more on the synapse, therefore increasing its inhibitory effect. Valproic acid acts on voltage-gated, voltage-dependent sodium channel. It channels specifically it blocks voltage-dependent voltage sodium channels. It also blocks GABA metabolism. Felbamate is a positive GABA mo A modulator. Topiramate um, is a GABA activated chloride channel opener. Zonisamide, so mechanism of action, no one really knows. But it might inhibit GABA uptake, enhance glutamate uptake, because remember, glutamate is your excitatory neurotransmitter. Therefore, enhancing its reuptake decreases the excitatory effects and increases the inhibitory effects. Zonisamide so also might block so sodium and T-type calcium channels. So here's a metabolism of GABA, which helps you understand the different inhibitors that act on it. So glutamic acid um, is metabolized to GABA um, by glutamate decarboxylase, or GAD. GABA is metabolized to succinic semialdehyde by GABA transaminase, or GAT. Um, succinic semialdehyde is metabolized succinate by succinic semialdehyde dehydrogenase. Um, hmm, let's see. Ooh, this is awkward. Um, nope, that's right. Okay. Um, ke alpha ketoglutarate is metabolized to suc succinate by succinic semialdehyde dehydrogenase. And you can go from alpha ketoglutarate back to, glu back to glutamic acid to start the cycle again. Basically, what you want to get out of this metabolism is glutamate decarboxylase and GABA transaminase. So, inhibiting either of these enzymes ends up with two totally different effects. So, inhibiting glutamate decarboxylase, or GAD, um, inhibits the formation of GABA. Therefore, you have less inhibitory effect and more excitatory effect. Therefore, you get more convulsions. Um, an example of GAD inhibitor is alloglycine. 
However, inhibiting GAT or GABA transaminase inhibits the metabolism of GABA to succinic semialdehyde, therefore increasing the amount of GABA, therefore increasing the inhibitory effect, therefore acting as an anticonvulsant, which is what valproic acid does. Um, your amino still beans are a class within this uh, class of compounds are di diabenzazepines. You can tell it's a dibenzazepine because it has the word azepine in it. Carbamazepine and oscarbazepine. Um, cool things. Okay, so carbamazepine is shown here. And it's metabolized to the epoxy form. If you read the Piro book, it said it's the metabolite is some epoxy. And here's your epoxy. Remember, your epoxy is a triangulated hydroxyl hydrox triangulated oxygen oxygen in the middle of a triangle. Um, so here's your epoxy group. Carbamazepine is metabolized to this epoxy group. Now, the reason it causes blood dyscrasias or hepatotoxic or uh, blood toxicities is because this part can actually react with hemoglobin. Because remember. Uh, Three-membered heterocycles are very reactive, just like I showed with your, um, what's the compound in the last exam? Uh, the one that forms, uh, you know, the, the, the nitrogen with that ring. I forgot the name. Um, anyways, so remember, the one that, when the arm that reacts with DNA, same thing. So, three-membered heterocycles... Are very active in this way same way the three member heterocycle here the one with the oxygen is very reactive and it actually reacts with hemoglobin there and other compounds in blood therefore causing blood dyscrasias cool fun fact um, oscarbazepine is a prodrug so this is not the active form this hydroxylated form is the active form not the double bond oxygen but the hydroxylated form is the active form other ion channel agents include motrogene, which is a sodium channel blocker that decreases glutamate release, lacosamide, which is a sodium channel, which acts on sodium channel by slowing the inactivation of it, um, and reticabine and enzogabine are calcium channel openers. Okay, so finally we're going to talk about the benzodiazepines for the millionth time. So if in case you don't remember, these are positive allosteric, positive allosteric modules that increase calcium influx through the GABA receptor. Um, SAR again, after Glennon's class. Um, so Guo wanted to emphasize that it's a three-ring structure, your A ring, your B ring, your C ring. Your A ring is the benzene ring, B ring has the nitrogens, C ring is the benzene ring attached to the B ring with the nitrogens. Um, so your B ring is responsible for hydrogen binding with the histidine. Um, so if you remember what a histidine looks like. So here's your histidine and here's your histidine side chain. Here's the rest of the amino acid attached to it. Um, so remember, hydrogen bond except hydrogen bond. A hydrogen bond is when one molecule takes a hydrogen from another molecule. So you see that histidine has this hydrogen right here. Um, right. Right here's your hydrogen. Um, so this hydrogen's gonna go here, all the way to this oxygen, and you form a hydrogen bond. Because remember, when I talked about acids, your hydrogens have a positive charge, and your oxygens have a negative charge. And oxygens are negative charges attract to the positive charges. And you form a hydrogen bond. Um, in the C ring, you have a hydrophobic interaction. So remember, light dissolves like, so lipophilic compounds like to be attracted to lipophilic compounds. So this lipophilic benzene ring right here 
is attracted to other lipophilic compounds like uh, methyl groups or other benzene rings. Um, let's see. Um, doo -doo 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 -doo. And this A ring forms pi pi interactions with phenylalanine, tyrosine, and tryptophan. So what are pi pi interactions, you might be wondering. If you're not, I'm going to explain it anyways. Um, so, you remember your all the way back in P1 MedChem, your sigma bonds, your pi bonds. If you don't, here's a refresher. So, if you know that uh, in a bond, electrons move throughout them. Um, specifically, they can move in a type of... So, a head-on or a direct bond between two atoms is called a sigma bond. Term a sigma bond. But when you, that's a single bond, as a sigma bond. However, when you add a double bond, electrons can't move all in that same space because they get squished. So, what electrons do is they take up one sigma bond, one sigma bond, directly attach the other bond, and they go perpendicular to that bond so that they don't squish up with the other electrons like this picture right here. So, to spread themselves out, spread themselves out, electrons occupy this region. So, electrons go here and they can go above and below each carbon in the double bond. This only happens with double bonds or triple bonds, not single bonds. Single bonds only have sigma bonds. However, when you add more bonds, electrons are going to go on top and on bottom so that they don't inter interfere with the electrons in between, directly in between the carbon. So, what you have now in a benzene ring, if I draw it out, double, 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 so you have electrons moving in between these carbons, these carbons, these carbons, these carbons, these carbons, these carbons, these carbons. However, for these double bonds, they're occupying the space above and below each carbon so that they can fit in the molecule and they don't run into the electrons between each carbon. So, when you add another benzene ring, add another benzene ring these electrons in the pi bond oh these are this is a term of pi bond by the way p bond the electrons bond top and bottom are called pi bonds um so when you bring two pi bonds together like here and over here these molecules actually combine. So the benzene's. So it looks. It turns out that the electrons in this pi bond and this pi bond actually interact with each other. They become attracted to each other. And this pulls the benzene rings together. And you get an overlap, just like that. So. If I could draw it out as a schematic. So here's benzene one and benzene two. These come together. Sorry, my pen is slow for some reason today. I think it's because I have too much stuff in this video. Okay. They come together to overlap. So one comes on top of the other because the pi electrons from benzene 1 and benzene 2 touch 
and now they interact with each other. Based so basically, um, a pi 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 interaction is where benzenes stack on top of each other because of their double bonds, which have pi electrons, and pi electrons stack on top of each other. So in the SAR of your benzodiazepines, in the A ring, you have the pi pi interaction with a benzene stack, and you can see benzenes in these amino acids. I'm not going to draw them out, you can look them up yourself, they're in any Google website. Phenylalanine, tyrosine, tryptophan, they all have benzene rings, therefore they can all form pi pi stacking or pi pi interactions, where the pi electrons stack on top of each other. Um, the B ring forms a hydrogen bond with histidine, with this oxygen and histidine, the, the hydrogen and histidine. And the C ring forms hydrophobic interactions because like dissolves like, and lipophilic comp molecules like to go to lipophilic comp molecules like benzenes. Um, you already know how to analyze SARs from Glennon's uh, lectures. So substitutions at the seven position increase anxiolytic activity. Substitutions at the 8 and 9 position decrease angiolytic activity. And I've labeled everything here for you. So, um, substitution at the 7, where you usually see a chloride, increases angiolytic activity. Substitution here and here at the 8 and 9 position decrease angiolytic activity. Um, at the B ring, substitution at the 1, 3, and 4 position may affect activity. So... Substitutions here, here, and here may affect activity. And in the C ring, substitution may affect activity. He gets more vague. It's kind of weird. Anyways, um, so test yourself. So this is based off slide 30. So is this molecule active as a benzodiazepine given the SAR we just presented? No. So even though it has the three rings like Guo mentioned as a requirement, and the hydrophobic ring, um, and the, let's see, pi pi bonds, because this is a double bond, there's a double bonds here in the benzene ring. This does not form hydrogen bond interactions, because this is not an oxygen, therefore it cannot form that hydrogen bond uh, network with histidine. Remember, you need an oxygen over here to form that hydrogen bond network. Um... I'll write the answer down. No. Everything else in slide 30 is active as a benzodiazepine. I just wanted to highlight this one because it's the one he highlighted in class. Needs. Oh, this pen is so slow. Oxygen. Or hydrogen bond. Okay, so the factors that affect the activity of a benzodiazepine include its lipophilicity and its metabolism. So increasing the lipophilicity increases plasma protein binding, increases its blood-brain barrier penetration because you know the blood-brain barrier requires lipophilic compounds, leading to a faster onset, act active metabolites, and a slower elimination. Uh, metabolism or biotransformation depends on the type of compound, the route, and the formulation. It can lead to short or long-acting compounds, active or inactive meta intermediates, or slow and fast elimination. To illustrate these concepts, I have these from his slides. So, um, as you can see here, which one would you expect to be more lipophilic? This left side or this right side? This left side is more lipophilic because it does not have the hydroxyl group which is like hydrophilic or this uh, carboxylic acid group. Remember carboxylic acid groups are pretty um, lipophilic. Um, so if it doesn't have a hydroxyl or a carboxylic acid, then it's pretty hydrolipophilic, 
therefore, as I said earlier, the lock compounds on the left have a faster onset, uh, active metabolites, and slower elimination. Because remember, increasing the lipophilicity leads to lower, uh, faster onset, slower elimination, and active metabolites. In terms of metabolism, you can have hepatic oxidation, such as demethylation, or loss of N oxide. So hepatic, hmm, hepatic oxidation includes demethylation, demethylation, and loss of the N oxide, which leads to so hepatic oxidation by demethylation or loss of N oxide leads to active metabolites and long duration of action. However, glucuronidation leads to no active metabolites and a short duration of action. And you remember, you can only glucuronidate hydro well, in this case, with the benzos, hydroxyl groups. So as you can see in these examples, um, this is your benzo. Now you're going to metabolize it to this one. So what reaction is happening from here to here? You have demethylation. So among so between these two compounds which would you expect to have the higher um, duration of action the this one or this one the one on the right because remember hepatic oxidation and demethylation leads to longer durations of action so this one expected to have a long duration of action as you can see, uh, which is evident by its higher half-life um, so now, going from here to here, um, which is, what reaction is happening there? Or, hold on, okay, never mind, never know that. Um, so, when you glucuronidate this one, would you expect the product to be, uh, to have a higher half-life or a lower half-life? than this parent compound. You expect it to have a lower half-life. So remember, glucuronidation leads to shorter duration of action. So demethylation leads to a longer duration of action with this compound. And glucuronidation at this hydroxyl group leads to a shorter duration of action in the resulting compound. So hepatic oxidation through demethylation leads to longer duration of action for the resulting compound, and glucuronidation at the hydroxyl group leads to shorter duration of action at the resulting compound. So, next question, what is happening in this reaction? It's loss of N oxide. So as you can see, your, oh, in case you didn't see, your methyl group, if in case you didn't see where the demethylation has, is happening, demethylation is happening here, to no methyl group here. So over here, the N loss of N oxide happens here, and you're losing the N oxide here. So does that lead to a longer duration of action or a shorter duration of action for this resulting compound right here? Longer duration of action, remember, hepatic oxidation through demethylation or loss of N oxide leads to a longer duration of action for the resulting compound. Uh, so this has a longer duration of action. And remember, glucuronidation at the hydroxyl group, so if you see a hydroxyl group, you have, you're going to lead to a shorter duration of action and no active metabolites. However, if you see an N oxide or demethylation, think hepatic, hepatic oxidation, therefore a long duration of action and active metabolites. Chlorazepate is a prodrug where you lose the carboxyl group. So here's chlorazepate. Here's your carboxyl group, and you're going to lose it here to the active drug. Diazepam is long-acting. It has active metabolites, desmeth uh, namely desmethyl diazepam and oxazepam. Through IV formulation, it's a fast-acting compound. However, redistribution of the drug to other organs decreases its action. Okay, so let's see. I organize in graph form what he said in word form. Um, hopefully these terms are very familiar to you by now. So you know that agonist 
produce a full effect. We'll say plus one is the full effect. Zero is the baseline, baseline effect. Um, partial agonists produce not full effect, only partial effect. Therefore, you see a partial effect of 0.5. Uh, you can, th through because of this, you can say it acts as an agonist because it activates the receptor to produce an effect. However, it acts also acts as an antagonist because it does not f produce a full effect. It, dec it has a decreased effect compared to the agonist. These have less side effects and less abuse and withdrawal. The examples of these drugs include abecarnil, bretazinil, and imidazinil. Your antagonist prevent the agonists from binding. They affect the affinity, but not the efficacy. Um, let's see. Uh, namely, they don't affect the flow of chloride through the GABA receptor. Uh, examples of these, these include, these include flunazanil and propyl beta carboline. Um, you have two types of antagonists. You have competitive and non-competitive. So competitive antagonists are overcome by adding more agonist. For example, you have a receptor, and you know that the agonist binds at this site, but here you have your antagonist. Now if you have one agonist, you can't really overwhelm the antagonist and displace it. However, if you have more of the antagonist, it's gonna if you have more of the agonist, you're going to push the antagonist out because there's more agonist that's able to interact with the receptor. However, with non-competitive antagonists, these do not act on the same site as your agonist. Therefore, overwhelming the receptor with agonist does not change how the antagonist binds. It still binds to the receptor even though you have more agonist. Examples of those include flumazenil and beta propyl beta carboline. This is important because partial inverse or inverse agonists include methyl beta carboline and ethyl beta carboline. These um let's see these produce a negative effect on the receptor, so they, yeah, so from baseline they produce an effect of negative one. Partial ag inverse agonists are like partial agonists, except they work in the opposite direction. Instead of working at the plus direction, they work at the negative direction. And the effect of all of these drugs... is based on how they interact or how they change receptor conformation. So, let's see. For example, um, I labeled them for you. Here's your molecule, here's your GABA-A receptor, your GABA-A molecule, and your antagonist. So the agonist, which is benzodiazepine, acts on the receptor and it changes the conformation of the receptor so that it opens up and allows more chloride in. However, inverse agonists um, uh, bind to the receptor and bind to the receptor so that GABA actually leaves and has no effect. Therefore, you see an effect of negative 1 because there's actually pretty much no effect, you actually get the opposite effect, closing the channel, and you actually get proconvulsant, because if you can't let chloride in, then there's no inhibition, then you're actually going to proconvulse, or convulse. So actually, inverse agonists, as Guo said in his slides, are proconvulsants, because they kick GABA out, therefore GABA can, they kick chloride out, yeah, they kick GABA out, Convulse. Therefore, GABA can't let chloride in by binding to the receptor. Therefore, chloride can't inhibit convulsions. Therefore, inverse agonists are called proconvulsants. So, if I could describe the graph as convulsion, 
agonists at the GABA receptor prevent convulsion. Um, partial agonists partially prevent convulsion at the GABA receptor. So, and um, at the GABA receptor, antagonists produce no effect. However, at the GABA receptor, inverse agonists do the inverse of um, the effect of GABA on convulsion. Therefore, they do the inverse of inhibiting convulsion. Therefore, inverse agonists are pro-convulsants. Um, and over here, let's see. Um, antagonists um, kick the drug out of the receptor, basically. So here's your receptor, here's your antagonist. It's going to kick your drug out of the receptor so your drug, your agonist, cannot bind and allow more chloride in or enhance the effect of GABA. So before I go to the last slide of the lecture, just wanted to give a shout out to another request. This is Leia's cat. This is Amber. Or this is Remy, her cat. Remy's birthday was actually October 3rd. Everybody say happy birthday, Remy. Happy birthday, Remy. Um, he's called the... You follow Amber... You can follow Remy and Leia through Instagram at... at Amber.Remy. At A-M-B as in boy, E-R dot r e m y at amber dot remy you can see more pictures of remy this pretty looking cat it's called amber remy because you can see his amber looking eyes it's actually a really good looking cat probably one of the most good looking cats i've ever seen it's so royal too look at this stance you go dude um this is remy sleeping pretty cute right if it's not you don't got a heart or you just don't appreciate cats um Last slide, benzodiazepine analogs. The important thing from this slide is that GABA-A is a central benzodiazepine receptor. So it's a benzodiazepine receptor in the central nervous system. However, TSPO is a peripheral benzodiazepine receptor. Um, let's see. It's been found that um, PK11193 binds to this which actually leads to side effects including cancer. So benzodiazepines can actually bind to GABA-A and TS in the central nervous system and TSPO in the peripheral nervous system. And another compound that, that acts like benzos is PK11193. This actually binds to TSPO in the periphery just like benzodiazepines, which actually causes increased um, in which actually cause increased risk of cancer in mice. Where's my clothing parentheses? Close that parentheses. Okay, now to review everything. So, key, uh, key concepts of your ideal anti-epileptic agents. They completely suppress convulsions. They don't produce sedation or other CNS effects. They work on a wide variety of seizures. They don't and they have a rapid onset and long duration. Your first AE inside of the drug was potassium bromide. Um, your next class of drugs are your phenobarbital, your barbiturates, and your derivatives. Your prototype is phenobarbital, which is actually metabolized to parahydroxyphenobarbital, which is the active form and is the one that actually induces the CYP2B6 enzyme. Um, let's see, phenobarbital is more soluble, water soluble than methobarbital because it doesn't have the methyl group. Uh, methobarbital is less water soluble than methobarbital because it has the phenyl group. Um, barbiturates can switch between the lactam form and the enolic acid form and has a total of three acid groups. They can tautomerize, meaning it can shift the proton or the hydrogen around to make these different forms. Um, let's 
see. Now the you can form derivatives of phenobarbital and the barbiturates through isosterism to produce different anticonvulsants. So you can change it to be primidone by changing the nitrogen by changing the carbonyl group, the C double bond group to just, to just be a carbon group. Um, the hydantoins are actually five membered rings. Um, these have a total of two acid groups, therefore they're less acidic than barbiturates. Phenytoin is is a major hydantoin. Um, Mephenytoin, its S isomer is fourteen times more hydroxylated at the four position of the phenyl group than the R isomer. Uh, phosphenytoin is more water soluble because of the per more water soluble because of the presence of the phosphate group. It's such a pro drug or phenytoin. Um, your oxazolidine dions are isosteres of the hydrotoins, where you change the nitrogen to an oxygen. You can tell it's an oxazolidine dion by the root. I mean the suffix da dine dione. Zolidine dione. Succinamide, you can tell by the suffix oxinamide. Oxamide. These change the. These are isosteres of the nitrogen, changing to just a simple carbon. They have less activity. Your GABA analogs include gabapentin and vigabatrin. Here are all your mechanisms of action. Um, Important molecules in GABA metabolism, metabolism include glutamate decarboxylase, or GAD, and GABA transaminase, or GAT. GAD inhibitors, like alloglycine, produce convulsions, whereas GAT inhibitors uh, prevent convulsions through molecules like valproic acid. Your amino still beans include your dibenzapines, like carbamazepine and oxcarbazepine. Carbamazepine produces the epoxide whereas oxcarbazepine produces the hydroxyl group, which is active. Oxcarbazepine is a prodrug for the active hydroxyl group. More mechanisms, your benzos. Remember, you need your three-ring structure. Your A-ring forms the pi-pi or pi-stacking interaction with phenylalanine, tyrosine, and tryptamine, tryptophan. Um, your your B-ring forms hydrogen bonds with histidine at the oxygen. And your C ring forms hydrophobic interactions. Um, here are some different substitutions. Um, factors including influencing activity of your benzos are lipophilicity and metabolism. Um, let's see. Your li more lipophilic compounds have a faster onset, active, metab active metabolites, and slow elimination compared to your less lipophilic compounds. Hepatic oxidation through demethylation and loss of the anoxide produce as resulting compounds active metabolites and long durations of action, whereas glucuronidation of the oxygen produces no active metabolites and short durations of action. Clozapate's prodrug, where the carbox carboxyl group is lost. Diazepam is long acting, produces long acting. I can metabolize desmethyldiazepam, oxazepam. It's fast as an IV formulation, and well, however, redistribution, redistribution of the drug to other organs decreases its action. Here's your graph I made. Um, everything about how a drug acts, whether it's an agonist, partial agonist, antagonist, partial inverse agonist, or an inverse agonist, is related to how they change the receptor. Confirmation: How they change the shape of the receptor. Um, let's see. Say hi to Remy again. Happy birthday, Remy! Finally, your benzodiazepine analogs like PK one 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 nine can bind to the peripheral benzodiazepine receptor and can cause side effects like cancer. Um, in mice so far, not humans. Hopefully not. Um, so. If you have any feedback, comments, questions, concerns, positive feedback, constructive feedback, always feel free to leave it at um, polev.com slash mm, polev.com 
slash C H R I S T I A N R U I six two nine. And I will always check your comments. All right, have fun studying. And see you at Fidex Fest and Skate for the Cure. Actually, I won't be at Skate for the Cure because I'm working evening shift that week, that day. But I hope you go to Skate for the Cure for a good cause.